who after being also a successful entrepreneur and uh, having had a public life um, uh, is now well uh, based from Indonesia uh, will also help us reflect uh, on this crisis um, from uh, from Asia. Um, so, and I will uh, myself, uh, I'm Gabrielle Gauthier, based in France, uh, right now uh, with the lockdown, um, uh, working from home, but um, uh, for a big firm called Total, and I will tell you a little bit more afterwards, perhaps we can have a few words of introduction. Uh, I let perhaps Armin introduce himself, and then Sandhyaga. Armin, a few, few words about where you are now. Well, thank you, Gabrielle. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and honor being in your company again. Uh, you know, we, uh, we've been, uh, we've worked together on uh, so many different platforms and now uh, we've never done this this way, you know, when we're actually sitting together, you, you are somewhere in France and I, I am somewhere in Armenia and, uh, and we're doing this type of conference uh, together, having a conversation about, about current affairs, but also, uh, well, what the world is going to look like tomorrow. Uh, I'm in Armenia now, I'm in Yerevan, in the capital of Armenia. As, as Gabriel, you just mentioned, I am uh, heading uh, the Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology. It's an organization that is uh, helping produce an ecosystem that drives scientific advancement and technological innovation in Armenia and beyond. Uh, so we do a lot of work in, the, in, the, in deep technologies and scientific uh, verticals, uh, specifically in artificial intelligence, biotechnologies, advanced materials, and robotics. I'll leave it here because we would also want uh, Santiago to be well. Okay, Santiago, if you can perhaps introduce yourself. Well, thank you very much uh, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for me here uh, from Jakarta, Indonesia. My name is Sandiaga Salahuddin uh, Uno, and people call me Sandy. I, uh, I was an entrepreneur by accident because uh, during 97, 98 Asian financial crisis, I lost my job and by sheer uh, accident and out of desperation, I started uh, a financial consulting uh, firm uh, with uh, a couple of friends of mine, uh, focusing on helping company to restructure uh, their balance sheets in the, in the aftermath after the Asian 97, 98 crisis. That uh, small firm that uh, I started uh, today actually grew to be one of the largest uh, investment company in Southeast Asia, employing around 30,000 people. Um, and we invest across sectors, uh, including oil and gas and clean energy. Um, we also invest in technology and uh, infrastructure, telco infrastructures. Uh, I left uh, the private sectors to move into the public sectors in 2016. Uh, I uh, contested and uh, successfully ran for the uh, gubernatorial and vice gubernatorial elections for Jakarta in, in uh, 2017. Um, after a year serving uh, at the city hall, I was nominated as the candidate for vice president in the last year's uh, election, uh, the 2019 elections. Obviously I lost and that's why I'm available. If I win, I would not be available for this, <laughs> this call. So uh, here I am back uh, on a gardening leaf. Uh, I am starting a small platform for social entrepreneurship on job creations, as well as uh, focusing on investing in uh, clean infrastructures, uh, clean energy. So that's my, my brief bio. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel and Armin, for inviting me to be in this uh, very, very interesting webinar. Thank you very much. Um... Sandhyagar and, uh, and Armin. 
Um, as of myself, I my my first prize is to be member of the board of the um, Foundation uh, Fondation Armenienne for Science and Technology. Um, uh, I've known Armin for uh, for a few years, working on how digital could change the life um, of people, uh, especially in development, in health, in education. Um, while I was at the executive committee of a big uh, digital uh, firm, which was Alcatel Lucent at the time, um, I, I had several roles in the in the telecom industry. Um, both in, in, in business and in, uh, uh, in the public sector. I was the, uh, the board of the French regulator and I was the vice chair of the European regulators in telecom. Um, and I, was, I had a lot of contacts with Asia and, uh, and uh, also the US uh, uh, in this field. Um, I have been a little bit in helping um, ministers, especially opening up uh, the telecom sector to competition. And uh, after having spent a few years uh, coming back to invest for my country, as I was uh, heading the, um, the, the investments for uh, Caisse de Depot, which is a, a sort of French sovereign fund to develop the country in public-private partnerships in all areas of infrastructure, transport, telecom, energy. That's where I learned how energy was really so vital but also small and business impact um, the companies uh, and smart cities, I decided to move uh, to another sector and to make uh, things change in one of the uh, very well-known company that is one of the most, the biggest polluters, accused of being, being the biggest polluter, that's um, uh, Total, which is an oil and gas company. But what is less well known is that it's a very fast moving company in renewables, in new energy, in clean energy, uh, and also has an urgency to move and to switch and I'm heading uh, these um, activities, which is called carbon neutral businesses within Total, which is both um, for energy efficiency, the innovation of Total, uh, but also the the sinks, carbon sinks, uh, nature-based solutions, investing heavily in forests. We were one of the most heavy investors in nature-based solutions. Uh, you wouldn't believe that from an oil and gas company, but that's how it is. And of course, hydrogen. So few new energies for the future. Um, now, um, I would like to organize our panels um, with a few, uh, around a few topics. The topics is mainly uh, recovery and how do we see um, the new, uh, the, the recovery, uh, mainly in the industrial sectors that we know best of, uh, but how do we also see the role of governments dealing with that? Uh, with, we're not going to talk about the medical uh, aspect of this crisis, although it's, uh, it's, it's very important. And perhaps the first thing is, uh, I will ask each of the panelists and try to answer myself, is what have you seen and what are the lessons um, from the reaction of the governments and the sector, the support, and the, what are they trying to do best? And then how do we see that from our industry point of view? So the first perhaps round of question is, um, what are you seeing from the governments and from the, um, uh, from the recovery plans that are emerging? Um, what is in for, uh, the areas of the world you are in and for your industries. Perhaps, Santiago, you can, from your experience from public and private, how do you see governments handling this in, in, the, in the region you know best? We don't hear you, Santiago. I don't hear you at least. Um, okay. Very, very um, good questions, Gabrielle. And it's too early to tell at the moment um, because this is unprecedented uh, crisis that we're facing. Um, if you allow, uh, I have prepared a deck uh, not too long, maybe two or three slides that I wanna quickly flip through to uh, sort of like tee off our discussions today, which relates to your questions in terms of how Specifically, we're, we're dealing with uh, this pandemic and uh, things how to move uh, forward. So with your 
Uh, is it okay, uh, Gabriel? Yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Sure, sir. Right. So, um, basically, the, uh, the, what I would sort of like term this uh, InnoFast. We need to innovate very fast uh, to, as a result of this, uh, this crisis. Um, the, um, what, uh, what we are seeing uh, uh, here is a very unprecedented uh, situation. And the funny thing is it's all over the world. Uh, 200 countries, 3 million people plus uh, are affected by this uh, pandemic. And uh, the funny thing about this conference call is that you represent Western uh, Europe uh, and probably French speaking world uh, mm -hmm. Armin's uh, uh, represent the Americas and probably Central Europe and I, I represent Asia. All of us are uh, uh, basically affected. But I want to talk more in particular about Indonesia. It's the largest yeah. country mm -hmm. in uh, Southeast Asia whereby the economy is driven 99% by SMEs. Job creations is 97% of SMEs and 60% of the uh, of the uh, GDP is uh, contributed by SME. You look at this curve before. How this uh, recession curve uh, is going to take shape in the next uh, few weeks? So we are early in this uh, curve, uh, and I think uh, we are anticipating that uh, hopefully if we deal with the health crisis with the right policies of territorial lockdown uh, in Indonesia has uh, moved uh, rather uh, fast recently uh, in terms of putting the uh, territorial quarantine, we will see hope will be a much uh, more flattened uh, in terms of downward recession curve. Um, Learning where, where we are at the moment is uh, we just need to test, test, and test. I would, I would, I would uh, term it three T's, test, trace, and treat. So if you look at this, uh, we have very limited testing capacity at the moment, and we're ramping up. So this is how we should innovate, how we could uh, get some social innovations in order to help each other uh, to have a much better testing capacity. And PCR by far is the gold standard. Uh, so everybody's ramping up uh, while we're waiting for the vaccine. This is a social innovations. It's a picture of me today in the morning uh, whereby I visited a small uh, initiative by uh, the group of volunteers that I'm, I'm heading now uh, over the last five days, we have tested 3,000 uh, Jakartans uh, for the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus. And uh, people who got the positive uh, indications will be escorted to the nearby hospitals, uh, while you know majority of the people who are negative, tested negative, they would go back with the food supplies. And this is how people to go out uh, for testing. Uh, another uh, innovation uh, you mentioned about uh, the winners. The winners are, are basically local herb uh, suppliers to boost your immunities. Uh, now we just realized that uh, there are actually uh, uh, ways for us not to just rely on imported vitamins, but there are uh, also uh, traditional uh, plants, herbal plants that, that grow so well in Indonesia and could be used to boost your immunity. So these are clear winners. Of course, the losers are the transportation business and uh, travel, uh, the hospitality, but uh, the pharmacies, e-commerce, uh, new uh, clean technologies, uh, uh, clean uh, infrastructures are, are uh, clear winners in, in this pandemic. Uh, where we are here, we need to more move towards, uh, I guess, what, what, what would I call a quadruple P, public, private people, 
uh, partnership, uh, including the, the academics, in terms of how we could work together better. Uh, we cannot just rely on government. Government needs to facilitate uh, and become co-creators of innovations. Uh, private sectors will lead and I guess communities will also need to participate. Uh, these are the stages we are in. Uh, for businesses, uh, of obviously we're in the first two, uh, I guess uh, the, the cycle, uh, the, the two brackets that we're very early in the cycles whereby just pandemic began. Indonesia is now adapting to new normal. Uh, and actually we're reaching a peak in the next couple of weeks. So we, need, we just need to be calm. Uh, the storm is coming. And then we just have to survive through ecosystems. And this is the ecosystem that we're trying to build uh, through technology. And that's why I'm very interested to have this session talking to you and Armin. What would be the new normal? And post COVID-19, what type of industries that we need to uh, redevelop? Should we think about uh, the renewable uh, energy? Should we go into carbon neutral industries? And uh, other new normals. Uh, we were talking earlier, Jakarta's uh, traffic is much nicer now compared to when Armin was here a couple of months ago. This is a, a new normal. Uh, wearing a face mask uh, like this. This is a new normal. Uh, and this is uh, spurring local uh, small and medium enterprise to produce, uh, switching uh, from making traditional uh, clothing to face mask and PPEs. Uh, what are the new normals? The other new normals are uh, uh, basically more uh, how do we survive uh, through ecosystems. Uh, should we continue to build coal fire power plant? Maybe not. Uh, maybe we should switch to solar and uh, wind uh, turbine uh, and stuff like that. So I'm very interested to, to discuss with you guys also on, on what would be the new normals coming uh, out from this COVID-19. So finally, that's uh, my presentation. Terima kasih is thank you in Bahasa. Uh, stay home, stay safe, and don't forget, you could be stay home. You could continue to stay home, but you have to exercise because if you exercise, your body immunity will improve and get some sun uh, also, although uh, just around uh, uh, your block and making sure that you stay optimistic. Uh, I'm sure the, the storm will, will pass through. Uh, I'll uh, thank, I'm really thankful for this uh, opportunity to uh, talk with you guys and I'll uh, switch it back to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much. We can't hear you, Gabriel. Yeah, okay, sorry. Thank you very much, Santiago, and uh, we'll make a second round um, to be uh, uh, with you on how you see the, the new future and the, which is, uh, or the new world um, compared to the old one. Armin, perhaps you can say a few words of how you have viewed um, from, because you have, you, you, of course, you're based in Armenia, but you have a deep experience also of other parts of the world, especially the US. How you have viewed uh, countries handling the crisis um, um, before we step to what are your views on the recovery? I think uh, the economic field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, one element that remains true, I think, for any government is uh, the reactive nature of this, right? And it's not to the fault of governments. Uh, you didn't have an episode of this nature at this scale for many governments to be prepared somewhere. I mean, if you think of how, uh, for instance, Taiwan has handled it almost uh, masterfully, right? but they were also uh, predisposed. They were exposed to SARS uh, some 15, 20 years ago, uh, and that was educational for them. So they knew exactly what to do, and they very, very, very quickly, they, uh, they locked down and they did all the right things for them to stay ahead of the pandemic. Um, um, if you look at the government here in Armenia, or if you look at the US governments, you know, it's, uh, there is a lot of differences, but there's also similarities in, in terms of, again, reactive approach, uh, this is what's happening. It's, it's, it's peaking, uh, trans, uh, transmission is very high, so we need to do certain things that are um, unusual. 
Um, it's it at a cost of almost uh, killing an economy for you to keep uh, people healthy. Um, so there are consequences that come with that. It's also very um, difficult decisions for, to make for the government. Uh, for the American government, for instance, it's uh, it's even uh, more difficult only because you're you're not one state. You know, you're, you're 50 states that have their own uh, intricate ways of governing, their uh, intricate ways of handling healthcare issues, economic issues, and also their constituencies are markedly different. You know, if if you look at the United States, how people think and behave on the coast is, is very different uh, than uh, mid-America. So all of, all of those uh, elements that need to be taken into consideration. I would say, you know, uh, what uh, San, uh, Santiago was uh, pointing, the uh, qu uh, quadruple helix is, is an interesting approach, right? Getting all of these uh, actors involved, getting uh, all these stakeholders involved. This is, this is an important way of driving this forward. Uh, including academia, including uh, public sector uh, and, and the government. There's still a lot of unknowns. We don't know what we're dealing with. We don't, you know, we continuously uh, talk about peaks and waves, meaning, you know, it's going to come in, it's going to peak out, and then it's all going to uh, uh, get better. But what if it's a mountain range, right? Uh, meaning this is one of the peaks that you're experiencing. Um, and the actual peak is far away, right? So it's, you're dealing with Himalayas rather than uh, Mount Fuji, for instance. So uh, things of that nature are not known for the government as well, you know, and until you have such things as you have a vaccine in place and you have herd immunity, these two things, uh, one or the other, um, I think you have really a challenging environment uh, to govern regardless where you are, whether in Indonesia, France, Armenia, or United States. Thank you, Armin. Perhaps I, uh, what uh, I can say a few words about what, uh, uh, how I've viewed this. Um, first of all, the crisis was a revelator that uh, of um, the one planet we live in, uh, the, the 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 speed at which the the virus spread all over the planet, the pandemic, the global pandemic, just told us that we could there were no boundaries and no frontiers for this. Uh, such a thing. So that's a revelator of, uh, you know, the, the global world we live in. And at the same time, I think it's a great revelator of, um, uh, it's paradoxical because they, the countries have, a lot of countries have pulled back to, on them, you know, sort of experience a drawback on their own territory. So saying now we must handle this ourselves and they have handled it in very different ways. So the crisis is also a revelator of existing divisions in the world that could perhaps that have been revealed uh, come up to the world. For instance, the, the lack, the, 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 the drop of leadership of the USA uh, over the world and the fact that, and the revelator of the, of the sort of difficulty to handle national security issues and health issues. Um, second, the, the revelator of the, the split in Europe and the hesitation and the and the, the time taken by governments to take decisions and no unique you know, no unique decisions. Some of the countries were closing their their, their frontiers in Europe. Some others not. So it was a, a sort of you know higgledy piggledy manner handling the crisis, not as a whole, you know, altogether. Um, it has shown, of course, the rise of China dealing that with great authority and uh, in a way that a lot of countries would not have accepted. I mean, the, the, the authoritarian way of China dealing with, with, with the crisis. And then the way of new actors popping up in a very sometimes awkward time, but trying a uh, way, but trying to, to do things on their own, Brazil, India, Turkey. Um, the drop of interest of the world for developing countries. I mean, in, in a, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, everybody in time of crisis is sort of drawing back on its own economy. So that's also something that is that is quite striking. Um, second thing, it's it's a comeback in all countries. The first step, but I think the, there will be a third one. The third step is a, the, the comeback of the state. I mean, there is no debate in France, whereas there's always a debate, uh, always been a debate in this in the place of the state in Europe in the economy. Who I have not seen one single newspaper 
um, the, for instance, the, the transport industry in Air France is almost um, is in a big crisis. Now, the state has decided to step back into in the equity of national champions. Now, that could not have been imagined, uh, you know, and there, there were huge debates about this, the state stepping back, uh, doing certainly PPPs, but not, not intruding in the, in the equity of, of companies. It's coming back without any debate. Um, so the, 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 the virtues of free trade have just, are just, you know, you know are in the back, in the back the yard. And it's the, the debate is unemployment, is safe national champions. And, and also what we see is the importance of local, of regional and of handling things locally uh, in the first step, in the first step. And the, 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 of course, the, because those who suffer the most are either in some areas, the, the transport, the tourism with the event, I think we'll talk about this later, the event industry and, and you know, this type of, of um, is suffering a lot. Uh, and also the small um, local uh, services that tend to shut down restaurants and things like that, you know, and there will be a lot, a lot of uh, a huge economic crisis, because as Sandioga said, SMEs have handled the crisis, or at least the majority of the SMEs, not all, have handled the crisis far, it, well, it's far worse for them than for big companies that have liquidity and have time to save. Let's face it, and, and we, it's still not over. Now, I think in the third phase will come, where we'll see, I'm still on the, that it, the, because of this huge crisis that will come and the value opportunities will, will, will be perhaps more positive in the, third, in the third round of questions. But let's face it, there will be a huge uh, economic crisis and we are preparing, we're getting, in, and states are getting prepared for that. Uh, I think the third part will reveal us that we will not be able to solve it without a collaboration, without G20, without IMF, without some help from an international collaboration on research for, to find a vaccine, to, to find the virus around collaboration in research. Um, an increased um, uh, intricacy of, uh, so, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's something there is a paradox. I think this crisis is a, is a real revelator of uh, divisions, existing divisions and weaknesses in our world. Now, perhaps my second round of questions is, is what to all of you, and uh, I will try and answer, um, what impact do you see on the various sectors and who do you see, of course, as winners and losers before we come to the recovery? Uh, perhaps Santiago, you, you touched already a little. Santiago, you touched already a little bit on some of it. But where do you see in your country? Um, because there are, there will be, there will be losers in this crisis, but there will be also opportunities. But uh, no doubt, some sectors are suffering more than others. Perhaps you can say a word about that. Well, potential winners, and actually now the clear winners uh, in the last one and a half months are basically the pharmaceuticals business, the healthcare sectors. I am so uh, fortunate that right before I left uh, my investment firm to go into the public sector, we made some uh, investments in these particular sectors. Um, the clear winners also are the food, uh, I guess, uh, food supplies, uh, providing basic staples. The clear winners are the e-commerce, which is now serving the necessities, basic necessities of the populations of Indonesia. The clear winners are the IT business. And this is like, uh, I guess we have to um, accelerate our adoptions to the era of industrial 4.0. Uh, now we're working from home, so any type of services and products that supplies and support working from home is booming now. In Jakarta, it is very hard to get a webcam. Uh, if you wanna, if you wanna order a webcam, you cannot find it. Uh, speakers, um, Wi-Fi. Uh, we have 150 million uh, internet users, and during this time. 
actually i want to also say hi to the facebook uh, uh, audience uh, they uh, about 600 facebook audience the last time i checked uh, who's following is very late uh, 10 30 in in jakarta now uh, but uh, these are the areas that we see potential winners, as well, uh, also traditional herbs are potential winners, um, cybersecurity providers, potential winners. We have so many times uh, what we call Zoom bombing, uh, whereby we were in the Zoom sessions and there are intruders coming. So uh, cybersecurity is going to be the potential winners. Um, clean energy. Definitely potential winners. Uh, the stuff that you are doing, carbon neutral is going to be, because people are now starting to think we need more sustainable practices in terms of how we uh, make sure our economy is growing uh, in the future post COVID-19. Uh, potential losers, uh, definitely the airlines now, but if this COVID-19 is over, there will be pent up demand. People will travel like crazy because uh, especially, uh, but they will have to start getting used to social distancing. So I guess prices will, will have to be uh, also adjusting to the new normal. It may be more expensive for people to travel. Uh, and I guess, Hotels and hospitalities are uh, kind of in uh, potential losers at, at this uh, time around. But going forward with the right uh, type of approach, uh, I think they're going to bounce back. Uh, I'm hoping for a V-shaped recovery, a V-shaped recovery, uh, not too deep uh, and not too wide in terms of the time elapsed. So yeah, I I'm an entrepreneurial I'm I'm an entrepreneur by training. So I I'm uh, actually see glass uh, half full rather than half empty. It's tough time now. A lot of people are really suffering, but I guess there are silver lining and there there will be lesson learned from this crisis. Uh, Gabriel, thank you very much, uh, Sandhya. Uh, for, for these uh, for these answers, when you say when you say that um, um, the transport that we will travel again like mad, uh, well we'll see we'll see if we you know a company like us is rethinking the way that it was sending its employees all over the world without thinking and without you know about also the the the, the carbon footprint of these um, of these air travels. So I think. Uh, what we have uh, in mind is to be much more cautious, even after the crisis, on sending people all around the planet, um, which for some travels that were perhaps not as justified as, uh, and, and the use of these, you know, um, uh, of these teams and Zoom and uh, <laughs> events, I think will be increased. So I, there might be a little less uh, traveling than uh, from, uh, from big companies like ours than right. in the past. I, I, I completely agree with you. I used to be in the from the financial uh, sectors whereby we do regular road shows. Uh, we go meet investors in person to Europe, to America, and we, we travel like crazy. Uh, but yeah. now uh, looking back, you know, we may not need to travel to New York for just like a day, a day and a half. We could, we could do it as efficiently through through this technology so you are absolutely right and i think there will be major rethinking about people mobilities going forward but in terms of like uh, uh tour uh and travel business uh there will be some moderations but i think they they, they, they will have to, to yeah. bounce back because that's the creative uh, side of the sectors that will uh, i guess uh uh, will help to support uh, those industries. Armin, what are your views on the, the winners and losers of the, especially in the, uh, perhaps in Armenia, and, but also in other countries that you know well? Yeah, I, I, I would, uh, you know, large, largely I would concur with both of you on, on the selection of um, areas that would see a decline and the selection of areas that would see an uptick. 
I would say, you know, I, I would pick several industries as industries that will be in decline or otherwise you call them uh, losers. I would say commercial air, airspace, aerospace, leisure, tourism, um, you know, so this is, this is going to get a big hit. And I would say uh, the recovery is going to take an indefinite time. I, I think not until a vaccine is in place uh, for instance, airlines in the U.S. have parked more than uh, 2,800 planes. Um, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, the airline industry overall around the globe has lost over $300 billion this year, or this year uh, already. Uh, this is the statistics by International Air Transport Association. I was just uh, looking at that a couple of days ago. So commercial airspace is, is going to, um, and I'm, I'm with you on this, uh, Gabrielle, you mentioned that even in total, you're rethinking how you're going to be using your business travel as well. Travel is also going to suffer, uh, just general travel, travel, not business, uh, in the short term, until at least we flatten the curve. Um, I think that will, that will take a hit. Oil and gas, uh, and to a lesser degree, even energy. Um, electric power, natural gas, you know, this is temporary, but if, if, other, if other sectors are experiencing declines, there is really no need. Uh, Santiago mentioned uh, that the traffic in Jakarta has eased up, and I remember, you know, I mean, in, in, uh, if anyone has gone to uh, Indonesia, and especially trying to get around in Jakarta, it is, it is one of the biggest challenges I think that humanity has ever faced. You know, it's, it's, it's really a tough place to, uh, to get from one place to another. And you know, so those uh, those types of um, ease up on the road or uh, major manufacturing or industries when they're in decline naturally, you're not using as much energy. So oil and gas, it's also a temporary, but it's going to it's going to take a hit. Real estate, uh, you know, I think for commercial real estate, it will be a deeper impact than maybe you know buying homes or rentals and what have you. But still, until full economic activities are restored, uh, you know, people are not going to have money. They're not going to have Free, free cash for them to, or liquidity for them to invest in real estate, or to be able to actually um, unload them, right? So for them to be able to sell them is, is also going to be a difficult. Thing. I don't know, apparel, you know, fashion, uh, luxury goods. Um, you, you're, you're not on Fifth Avenue, you're not on Rodeo Drive any longer, you know, at least uh, you're not in the same capacities for you to be spending uh, awful a lot of money. And then also, you're most of the time, I don't know about you guys, I mean, my PJs at my house, right? It's very comfortable. Uh, they don't need to be silk. They don't need to be made by, uh, I don't know, uh, by one of these big designers. It's, you know, if I can if I have something that's worth $5 and, you know, it suits me, it's fine. So I think these, these areas are going to have an immense uh, challenges for them to recover. Now, uh, but as, as to your point, there's also, uh, Industries, I want to say, that will draw more attention. I think uh, Sandy mentioned uh, medicine and uh, pharmaceuticals. I, I, I want to just encapsulate, I want to say biomedicine and biotechnology. I think until such time when we, we feel secure, we're confident that we can deal with our health and physical insecurities, um, you know, these areas are going to prosper. I, I don't know if you're following some of the things that are happening in that space. Um, it, incidentally, one of our co-founders of, of, of FAST, one of the co-founders of FAST is also a co-founder of Moderna uh, and uh, the chairman of Mo Moderna Pharmaceuticals is the, uh, uh, the company in the United States that is uh, getting into the second phase of uh, testing the vaccines. It's, it's the most advanced of all the solutions that exist out there. You know, there's I think 78 or 80 or maybe even more now, but Moderna is on the forefront of it. And uh, you know uh, Nubara Payam very well. He's given several uh, interviews and he, he was talking about this um, in, in general during one of our last webinars. I want to also go to AgTech. Uh, global supply chains have disrupted, right? So there's also some sort of a nature of isolationism. Think of what's happening in the United States or self-reliance when you're blocking everything down, you're not expecting, you know, you're not uh, bringing people in, in this. In Armenia, for instance, you know, Armenia is a landlocked country, has four neighbors only, you know, and two of them not in good relationships. So your, uh, your supply chain is, is really reliant on, on ease of transportation going back and forth. So border and travel concerns are going to be a huge deal. They may force nations to adapt national level policies uh, to be able to produce enough for self-sufficiency. 
And these are the things, you know, you, you thought probably in early part of 20th century, but after World War II, you stop thinking about this. But uh, situations of this nature are going to um, enforce this. You know, I, I, I recently saw that uh, pork, chicken, beef plants in the uh, United States are forced to shut down. Uh, but even shutting down a, a plant, a large plant like um, Tycho's, uh, for even short period of time, uh, this is millions of kilos of meat that disappear from supply chain. And people are expecting to go to stores for them to be able to, you know, it's like it, it hasn't arrived, but it really depends how long the pandemic is going to last and uh, how fast we're going to. But these are areas that you can invest. Act tech, you know, there is going to be a lot of, I think, interesting solutions. And last I'll mention, and then I'll come back to you, um, it's uh, educational technology. It's, uh, I mean, imagine like masses of young people, masses of people around the world uh, have shut down. The entire traditional educational system has been paralyzed. Until recently, online education was considered a fringe, uh, supplementary to whatever is happening in physical environment. But as you, the three of us are experiencing now, this is the only way for us to be together, for us to communicate. So I think there is a lot, a lot of opportunities. So I'll say, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in biomedicine, biotechnology, to act tech, and ed tech. Thanks, Armin. I think we'll come back to education and universities because we have we have a few questions on this. Um, what will be their long-term impact um, and uh, on their uh, renewal of education, perhaps, uh, of this crisis. So I think it will have some effect. Um, for me, what I notice, what I notice from, uh, well, here in, in Europe is, of course, the importance, the increased importance of digital. Everybody notices that, even in health, <laughs> e-health. Uh, Dr. Lieb is a, is a very popular platform. It was not, it, it made a boom, of course, within this crisis and, and local doctors uh, who saw the people no longer daring to go out. And uh, um, so these e-health platform, e-consultation have massively increased, of course. So this will change also the way we, we will live later. Um, uh, what has um, the importance of local, um, um, local provision of food. This has also will have a big impact um, and what you consume and how you consume and where is the food you consume? Where does it come from? So you no longer buy strawberries from coming from uh, the other part of the planet at, at the wrong period of time. And I can tell you what was a tendency before is now a massive, massive impact uh, in the population. Because, the, because eat locally, provide, make yourself safe, sustainable with local provision of uh, and how this has massively will change habits of people. And so food industry, um, of course, biotech and the importance of, of research and of having this, uh, I, I absolutely uh, agree with that. Now, tourism was for Europe, for France especially, uh, uh, a huge sector of development. Uh, in fact, it was a sector in which, as um, an investor, I invested a lot uh, to renew the, um, the, 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 um, the old estate, real estate in France, the castles, the old hostels on the right. There is a big concern about that. And I probably for Indonesia, it was also a big concern, but, of, but you have a mass of internal tourism to develop, perhaps that will save you from the problem that we are facing as Europe in Europe, which was the massive discovery of Europe by uh, Asian tourists, you know, being Chinese, uh, Indonesian, Indian, you know, what is that going to look like? Or are they going to stay more at home and discover their own? So that's a big concern, you know, or are they going to continue to travel and, uh, and, and it was a, a rising industry uh, and very, Quickly developing industry in our old continent, in our old continent, big concern about that. What is it going to look like? Um, and of course, the, the last thing is the the um, is we, are we going to see the relocation of some um, um, some um, uh, industries that had relocated to to China or to Asia? and that are trying to relocate. Uh, and this is a big move I know in the US. Now it's starting and I know we have a big, big um, companies reeling that are having plans 
of no longer outsourcing to 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 uh, uh, even to to uh, developing fast developing countries, uh, but relocating their provisions and and the industry. Uh, so this also might have um, might have an effect um, on some of the um, on some of the companies that that we know best. Um, now, perhaps I would like to rebound on Santiago what you said about clean and green, because, and I can say a word about that. Um, and is this move towards more sustainability, uh, in, which sometimes is, um, is not cheaper, is more expensive. Uh, renewable energy is for us more expensive than the like. So there are two, there is a paradox there. Some people say the crisis will cut all the efforts that people have done to switch to cleaner energy. Uh, even if the people have seen the blue sky of Jakarta, and I can imagine what that is because the last time I came, it was indeed a headache. Uh, and people are enjoying the blue sky of Paris and the like. But I mean, moving to clean energy sometimes takes time and is more costly for people uh, than fossil fuels and, and the like. So how do you see that? Do you see an increased move towards more sustainability? And I must say I have another question from, from, um, uh, for you coming probably from someone from Indonesia who would like you also to elaborate after the clean uh, part on how, um, what, what, how is the recovery, how are local resources going to be empowered to overcome the crisis, especially in Indonesia? If you can also elaborate on this question because it's a specific question from our audience uh, for you. So perhaps on the two questions on, on the, the green the revolution, is that going to move forward, even if sometimes it seems are more expensive, and on the recovery in Indonesia? Thanks. I am 100% uh, a big believer now because I've, I've invested uh, in various sectors in the natural resources uh, sectors. I had invested in the past uh, in coal, all in gas, um, and uh, most recently I created a, a platform uh, with a couple of very young uh, millennials uh, in uh, focusing on uh, clean infrastructures, clean energy, uh, new and renewable energies, ESG, environmental, social, governance, compliant uh, fund, uh, managing in uh, third party investors as well as uh, uh, family office. There's a growing interest uh, in investing in the space. I know it's going to be a big challenge when the oil price is almost zero uh, and people will say that why would we need to invest because the, the key is not uh, the key is not to look at it from a cost perspective. We've seen how uh, we've gone through cycles and if we're not switching the focus now to clean energy, the green energy, as well as green jobs. Uh, because at the end of the day, we need to provide jobs for Indonesia. And I think for Indonesians to focus on the more sustainable, long-term green jobs are uh, actually uh, more attractive. Uh, and I've, I've, uh, I'm, I'm speaking from my past experience and when you live through cycles of various crises, uh, you will see that uh, a more robust uh, investments in terms of providing a very stable return for investors are the uh, sustainable and uh, clean uh, investments or clean and green investments that, that you're making. And stuff like waste to energy, uh, these are new innovations whereby cities will have to adopt. When I was serving at the city hall, uh, Jakarta produced 7,000 tons of uh, um, municipality waste every day, and it's actually uh, going to the landfill. If we turn it to, um, to waste to energy, it's, it's going to be very, very, uh, it's a brilliant way on a public-private partnership so I am a big believer now uh, that we need to switch, uh, looking at it more from the sustainable point of view. Uh, but yeah, it, it will be a big challenge because a lot of people will say, hey, energy 
is so cheap while you are uh, investing in a more uh, in a much costlier uh, sectors. But I think this is in the best interest of not now, but maybe 10, 15, 20 years later. The millennials, which is now form part of uh, the majority of our demography, demands it. My uh, 20 year old daughters, they, they were the one forcing me to uh, relook and divesting into uh, divesting from our not so friendly uh, investment. So the millennials, uh, because they are dominating and they would want to make sure that the energy that they are getting are the, the clean energy. Uh, so going to the second, uh, the second questions, which is very interesting, you mentioned how we localize, we personalize, we, we customize things that we consume, it's happening. Because what happened when the Wuhan uh, COVID-19 started, we had to experience um, a stop in food being distributed from China. So we rely on garlic imports from China. So our garlic price shot through the roof um, and some uh, fruits coming in from China is also not available. So we started looking at why don't we grow it here? So urban farming, uh, vertical farming, uh, city farming with uh, a new technology uh, will, will, will take place. And I think people are starting to get more uh, responsible in terms of how they consume uh, and they want to make sure that they consume locally, local produce. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, and I think this is also driven the changes by the millennials because the millennials now wanted to find out, is it uh, important stuff? No, I want to have a lo local produce. And this is something that uh, we need to do to empower our farmers. They are 30% of the workforce coming from the farming sectors. 10% of the workforce coming from uh, uh, tour and tra uh, travel as well as uh, tourism industry. So we need to rely uh, a lot to, uh, I guess, local tourism. Uh, but if, for instance, uh, France is able to handle this uh, coronavirus, I think the demand is, is very big from this part of the world. To, to still go to Europe, uh, to still go to Middle East, especially in relations to the uh, performing the pilgrimage, uh, performing the, uh, the Umrah and the Hajj. Uh, it's it's big market. We have 270 million and one of the fastest uh, growing middle class. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's gonna be very, very interesting uh, going down uh, the road. People are customizing, personalizing, uh, localizing their consumptions. Uh, they want to, uh, you know, stuff that you wear. They want to make sure also it's local products. Uh, it's it's available now. They just been too entertained or too uh, mesmerized by imported, uh, you know, uh, the French products. Now the bags no longer going to be just Hermes or Chanel but it will be also local local and personalized products. So I guess, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities and, and I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic post COVID-19 that we will uh, have winners under the new normal situations. Gabriel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Armin, what do you see in the reshuffling um, of supply chain worldwide? And, uh, and do you also see this rise for local? I mean, you being having come back to your country to grow this local uh, uh, industry, uh, how do you see how do you see the opportunity? And uh, second, how do you see perhaps the the, um, the rising interest of uh, the young generations for everything that is sustainable? Um, I, I, I think we need to look at the human mind, how human mind works in, in the first place. Um, I think the longer we stay in this type of a setup, uh, we're going to adapt to the realities of today, right? And so they're going to force us uh, do certain things that we didn't think otherwise would be economically um, viable, uh, but now they will be, or they would not have been viable for us as individuals because it was not an expected or accepted way uh, for us to do business or for us to interact, socially interact, or. Uh, 
um, other ways. Uh, look, um, there's some, there is, uh, you know, uh, the monetary and fiscal policy makers, uh, they're, they're pulling all out, um, out all the stuff to keep the economy and uh, citizenry afloat uh, during this crisis, but still, some of the restrictions on economy are going to last a lot longer than uh, than we anticipate. You know, it's if if GDP uh, if the G GDP is declining uh, substantially, and you know, one of the worst of case, uh, the global G GDP declining by uh, six and a half percent, GDP of uh, you know in the United States declining by eight percent, over ten percent in Europe. Uh, when when you're experiencing these types of declines, uh, everything gets reshuffled. Um, I think, you know, we, uh, we spoke about um, farm fields and uh, agriculture. Um, if we, even if we look at greenhouse effects, um, agriculture itself, or life, uh, livestock itself is nearly 14 or 15 percent of all uh, as, a, as a contributor to greenhouse effects. Uh, and half of it is, I think, methane, which is even worse than if you were just going up with CO2, right? So, but if, but if, imagine if factories and farm fields were operated by smart robots, for instance, we will experience, experience very little disruption in economic activities. I know you said something in the nature that it's, it's more expensive. I think in the short run, it may be more expensive, but even if that's changing, you know, for you to have run, uh, let's say a solar, a solar farm 20 years ago was far more expensive and it contributed a lot more in greenhouse uh, effects than now, because a lot of the, so the supply chain is also transforming. So I think it's it's a matter of perhaps decade or 15 years when you bring it, when you bring the opportunity cost to nearly zero when it comes to um, uh, energy output from uh, traditional or from fossil fuels versus uh, new technologies. But we're not there yet, right? So we're not, uh, we're not there because the demand hasn't really been there. We don't produce these things on scale, nor do we rush to make the next version of it to stay ahead of the competition. Um, the traditional manufacturing facilities, for instance, or farmlands have little incentive to make major infrastructure investments. What for? Uh, where, when the old system works well. Uh, but today, um, it doesn't. So something has to give. And I think technology wins here. And I think this is where the millennials or the new generation, they're going to look at this and say, uh, you know what, here's an opportunity because it's going to be massively costly and it's also uncool. And that's very important because uh, you, you know, you you are uh, you are bothered or you are incentivized how social media interacts with you or how they how they look at you whether they're looking at you as a social entrepreneur or a constructive entrepreneur versus someone who uh, contributes uh, to the global mess, right? So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, out there, and you know, just one uh, very important thing I think here is. Uh, there was there would have been a lot of discussion about universal living wage uh, when cost of making goods ends up near zero or zero and i think we're slowly getting there so it's although it's you know you're looking at the traditional capitalism and you say this is insane this looks like socialism but i think the very nature of capitalism if it operates correct is going to lead us to that type of an environment and i don't think that's going to be the traditionalists to take us there it's going to be all of these disruptors all of those entrepreneurs you know people like santiago who, who who've Broken, uh, broken traditional uh, realities uh, time and time again. And I think many of our listeners who are entrepreneurs, be it in Armenia, Indonesia, France, or United States, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for them. Back to you, Gabriel. Thank you, Armen, yes. Um, let me say a word about how I see things. Well, it's true that um, uh, there was a move before the crisis, uh, and especially of millennials, I agree uh, with you, Santiago. And I also experienced this at home, living with them right now. I have four of them between 20 and 29. And it's a headache because they all the time, you know, sort of, um, uh, well, have their own views on what we should eat, the way we should uh, uh, recycle, the way we should grow salads in the garden, which we're right, right, trying to do, you know, and, it's, and, it's a, and they're ex putting it into practice. One of my daughters is, by the way, graduated from one of the best universities in France, has dedicated one year of her life cycling through, the, through France after having uh, traveled through Asia because uh, she didn't want to travel back that far because of, the, of, of the, the footprint, touring around before the COVID, what were the local experiences that made people change their habits and their way of life? 
and trying to find a way where she could invest her, her life doing that, you know, either growing things locally or recycling or other things. So it's, uh, you know, I, I live with her right now. It's not, it's not an easy at all because I get, you know, challenged all day long about the, our way of life and what we have done wrong and the like. So, um, and also at work, as I have the pleasure to lead the investments and the, um, the ventures of Total, I can tell you this, this uh, um, I have the same, I have the same uh, as at home. Uh, I mean, young people uh, wanting to, to invest in recycling and uh, in, um, in smart transport, smart energy. But by the way, um, I'm a little worried about some of the smart transport and the ventures that we have had uh, in this, of course, uh, um, some of our ventures are, I don't know whether they will overcome the crisis or not, you know, because there's no transport at all. So, and no need for, 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 for smart transport right now. But anyway, uh, so there will be some bankruptcies uh, among, among some ventures. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have to face this uh, um, and to see what, what we can do. So we're just right now thinking of recovery plans also to help. And some of our ventures in Africa, for instance, uh, are really, we're setting up a fund for a recovery fund to help ventures because they're, they're small companies that had engaged beforehand, even in this green tech and in this smart um, uh, autonomous uh, transport and the like, I mean, they have to be helped right now because otherwise they will not overcome the crisis. So we also have to face to face this. That's a parenthesis. Um, otherwise what I see also is, um, and, and uh, is uh, that um, we had, an, as I tell you, we had some, we were wondering whether, um, whether this will, um, the recover plans also of, of, of uh, governments, uh, whether they will cut because they have no more money, you know, they're going to face huge, our Western governments are going to face huge problems in public finance while they were already facing it. But I mean, with, the, with, with this crisis, it's not going to make it things easier. So are they going to cut all the, the transition funds that they were, or the PPPs they were engaging to facilitate this move from fossil fuels through gas, through clean energy? We all know that renewables are right now um, able to, to have uh, cheap, cheaper prices because of size, but they all have been helped um, at the beginning through purchase agreement with the state or long-term purchases agreements and things like that. Now, what I see is the contrary, which is to our, is an increased um, interest in topics like hydrogen, for instance, which is um, a renewed, which is a very old topic. But at the same time, all around the planet, I see a renewed, um, a renewed interest uh, to foster um, this, uh, the development of uh, what is called green hydrogen uh, compared to blue. Blue is uh, when you capture the carbon uh, from the methane because you, you, you make 10 times more CO2 than uh, when you make one ton um, of hydrogen. Um, but uh, green hydrogen is still five, six, six, seven times more expensive and will be before we get size. So this will come through purchase agreements, long-term contracts uh, uh, with the help of some states. And what I see, and I'm, I'm happy to see that, is that Europe is engaging in a green deal, which is, which is even re-emphasizing this. So that's a long-term view that um, I agree is something very, very interesting. Um, uh, the, the, it's uh, what I see is um, uh, so a, re a reinforcement uh, on batteries, EV charge, fuel cells, um, on re renovation of old buildings that were consuming a lot of energy, um, on, um, as I said, on um, hydrogen, a lot, a lot. I don't know if you see that as well. Um, and uh, how you you two view this from from the where from where you are, and then perhaps we'll have one last question about about. Um, education, university, and, the, and which is also very important. How will that come out changed by the crisis? Perhaps on these, on these new industries, uh, Sandhya and the way you view, you view this? I think, uh, 
education is one of the industry that for 100 years have not been disrupted. Uh, my, I have an eight-year-old son. Uh, I used to get him ready to, um, to school uh, uh, and then uh, drive him to school, uh, pick him up again. And now he, uh, he wakes up. He doesn't have to take showers. He just jump and do, and, and do Zoom uh, home learning. Uh, so it's a uh, big disruption. Uh, the classroom, uh, I think, will, will be uh, somewhat uh, going to be replaced by something more like this. Uh, Harvard is now offering uh, online classes for free. So I can get the best of educations in the world, maybe from Sorbonne. I used to travel to, uh, to Paris to get uh, summer school from Sorbonne. Um, I may not uh, need to travel to Paris anymore. I can get it online. So yeah, uh, I guess not only healthcare, educations will also uh, get disrupted uh, in, a, on a major, in a major uh, way. Um, but going back to uh, clean, clean and green, there are many questions about clean and green. Uh, and that's why I, I decided, uh, although I'm not going back to my old investment firm, I decided to team up with uh, a couple of uh, friends and I'm picking the younger, youngest of us all as the leader. Uh, and he's, uh, he's a millennial. Uh, I said that you lead this effort because you are thinking like millennials uh, uh, to, to think about clean and green. Uh, and uh, we, we just uh, started our fund. It's called 2020 because of the visions as well as the year. Uh, the, uh, the 2020 uh, uh, infrastructure development partners will focus uh, on, on this. And I think I would, uh, I would be really looking into on a, on a very uh, uh, focused basis uh, in order to change the energy landscape of uh, Indonesia and, and probably we could, we could be the agents for change. Because I see how millennials change on, on how we consume our food because uh, my two daughters, they are in the twenties now, are the ones uh, which is, um, you know, we, I don't really like uh, shark fins, but it's uh, delicacies that uh, a lot of uh, uh, in the Chinese restaurant in Indonesia serve, but we can no longer eat that uh, when, uh, uh, you know, when they were uh, growing up, they say it's cruel, no more shark fin and you should not uh, even if it's, uh, if it's a public event to consume that. Foie gras, they said, I know you like French food, but no foie gras anymore for you because uh, it's cruel uh, on how they do it. So uh, the kids are starting to, uh, the millennials, I would not say kids, but the millennials, these uh, changes in the Indonesian demography will drive the demand for energy, for food, uh, water uh, conservations. We used to be not really thinking, thinking about our water. We take our groundwater. Stop, people will now invest in uh, clean water. Uh, wastewater will also need to be treated. So a lot of uh, interesting avenues is going to be uh, coming up for rethinking post COVID-19. So maybe uh, with that, I end my uh, remarks and really thank you for for the time, I try to answer some of the questions in the chat, and if there are other questions, I I let uh, Armin's team to forward it to me for uh, to answer offline. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Santiago. Thank you for for sharing the, your your experience, which is uh, very interesting in this time, uh, this time of period of time of this move that you have done. Also, like myself, indeed, I've moved from the from the IT sector and telecom to, to, to this green sector, because I, I really think it's uh, something really vital for our, for our world and for the, uh, for the future of our, of our kids. And Armin, how do you see, can you say, do you want to say one last word about the way you see um, education, university, because you're also engaged in the future of the, 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 the youth of your, of your country, and perhaps how you see this crisis as an opportunity to disrupt what had not been disrupted and perhaps also disrupt some events. You have just done it with this event that we're doing, but 
Yeah, well, I, we have some questions about the event industry that had really not been disrupted uh, much and the people flooding to the CES to Las Vegas. It was, you know, I don't know what the footprint of this event is. And, <laughs> but do you think this will also change? Because the event industry had not been much disrupted. And um, more and more experiences experiencing uh, events like the one we're, we're just organizing right now. How do you see that, Arvind? That's an excellent question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll cut it short because I know we're uh, over time and um, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. need to get to the next things. But very quickly, look, we, we don't know. We haven't figured this out far out. And I, I'm not only speaking about myself, I'm speaking about, I think, globe. You know, we talk about uh, millennials, but I think now we've got to talk about Generation Z, right? So they, have, uh, they look at millennials. I mean, we're ancient, right? So they think uh, we're absolute dinosaurs and they're looking even at millennials uh, differently. So Generation Z is uh, very specific. Um, they don't have too much attention uh, to any, they don't pay too much attention to anything. They have uh, very short attention uh, to things. And I think uh, when it comes to education, uh, we, we really got a question as to what's the education today for, right? It, you know, when it, was, when it first became formal officially in 17th century, it was serving the needs of the government. And it was very necessary back at that time, you know, 400 years ago, but 400, 450 years ago, we're still using the same model today, which is, uh, which is insane. You know, it's like not, not much has changed. So we have a, a big time inflation when it comes to educated people. I mean, it's, it's, it's like printing money over and over and over and not being able to use. And that's, I think that's what's happening here, right? You have uh, back in the days, if you had a master's degree or a PhD, you immediately would land a job. It's not that you needed to look for a job. You were a part of a conveyor belt, you were there, and it, you immediately were going to get someplace placed. But today that's not the case because there is an inflation. So we need to deflate this. And the only way to deflate it, to really understand what is education for, is it for an individual or is it to really drive technological advancement forward? If that's the case, if the latter is the case, then you know types of curriculum that you're using, types of professors that you're using, infrastructure is very different. You don't need the classroom anymore. I mean, just, you know, just one thing, and I think San Diego and, and, and both of you will agree back when we were in classes, right? I remember your class, you know, your fifth grade, you walk into the classroom, your professor, uh, no matter what subject matter you're speaking about, your professor knows the most. There is no question. Your professor knows the most. Today, you walk into the classroom. There is nothing your professor can, can tell you that you cannot Google within 10 minutes, uh, 10 seconds. So that changes the dynamic. You're no longer the brightest thing in the classroom, right? So your role as a professor changes. Are you a professor or are you a mentor? You're probably more of a mentor. But if that's the case, you need to go to the classroom is the question, right? Then we go back to technology. The, the issue is, you know, and I just replied to some of our audience here, that premium virtual meeting solutions like Cisco's telepresence types have, have a potential of becoming a norm. But it's very expensive, uh, but look how quickly, let's say Facebook came up with uh, messenger rooms, right? To, to try to yeah. emulate whatever Zoom success is. Uh, but I still think we haven't figured out what is that really medium of a platform that's going to allow education to thrive. And it's not to fault of us because there was really no need for that. Everything was a fringe, but now I think this is forcing us to come up with something that's going to be uh, a requirement for distance uh, for virtual education, which will also drive meetings. And you know, let's be let's be honest. Let's be you know, it's like let me say something controversial, and I think you will uh, you will appreciate this. Between three of us, we attend a lot of meetings, a lot of conferences. Uh, most of them is useless. You know, it it doesn't play. It's no longer the same as it was 25 years ago or 30 years ago when you needed to go to these conferences. If you need to network. Do you really need to be at a conference with 20,000 people? You're probably better off in trying to have a cold introduction on LinkedIn rather than going to a 20 or 40,000 people meeting. So I think that that space is going to be disrupted, especially with uh, COVID-19. And it's due. But now the demand is going to force it. I'll end there, Gabrielle. Thank you very much, uh, Aramin. Now I think it's uh, I'm not going to be very long because it's uh, over time. I agree with you just to rebound. Um, uh, uh, of course, we had the pleasure to meet also on, on some of these conferences, but I can tell you since the crisis, I have been very active also on my LinkedIn, more than I usually are, and I've met uh, many 
people, especially in my field, in the, in the carbon capture field, for instance, uh, many interesting people with whom I've interacted just, you know, very easily. So you can also find, you can also find a way to keep open to the world. So it doesn't mean to um, sort of to relocate and, and shut yourself uh, in, your, in your country house and not, uh, not see the world. You can see the, the world from the, your local window. Um, which and your local window is going to be increasingly important as well. That's, uh, so it's both the paradox of this crisis and uh, perhaps on this note, I can say that um, uh, thank you very much for FAST for having organized this. I think that if we, if we were organizing this in two, three, four months or, or five months after the crisis, perhaps we would get another view uh, because uh, I think we had an evolving, I had at least an evolving view along all these past weeks which were perhaps some of the most interesting, difficult, but interesting, um, and that will definitely will not leave the world unchanged. And that's what we have tried to, to exchange between us. So happy to exchange again with you uh, some in, in some time and see what again has changed because uh, in our evolving world. Uh, but thank you very much, Armin and Fast and all the organizers for this very good event. It was a pleasure to meet Sandiaga from my little hole in France <laughs> to see uh, to see Indonesia. Great, great to all of you. Thanks, Thanks Gabriel. Thank yes. you for uh, for moderating this so masterfully, as always. Appreciate it. Santiago, good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Armin. Merci beaucoup, Gabriel. Thank you, Santiago. And... Hope to see you in person, though, one day, perhaps. <laughs> Thank <laughs> and you very you much. Good, bye -bye. French, good French food. And this region is very well known for its Seafood and oysters and wine. It's better to taste under the French sun, but uh, a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank, thank you very much to all of you, and thank you for the organizers. Thank you. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Bye mm. bye.